During the mighty Battle of the Trenton, the Continental Force under George Washington crossed the mighty Delaware River, and on Christmas Eve they attacked. They defeated a surprised and hungover British and Hessian army. They had the assistance of John Glover and his Marblehead Militia, who were a regiment of fishermen who were an amphibious unit because of their nautical skill in seafaring and other nautical enterprises. The Marbleheaders helped ferry Washington's men across the mighty Delaware, and after the battle came to a close, the Americans only suffered two deaths and five injuries, and they captured two-thirds of the mighty Hessian force. And after the battle, the victory at Trenton boosted American spirits to the max, and it inspired soldiers to serve longer and it also drew a great many new recruits. Fun fact about the, the mighty Battle of the Trenton. <laughs> Commander-in-Chief George Washington did not, as shown in contemporary legend, he didn't stand up in the boat when he was crossing the mighty Delaware River. General Cornwallis had planned to overwhelm and outnumber George Washington's tired troops in Princeton. The British forces did outnumber the colonial militia, with only 5,000 colonial militia and over 8,000 British soldiers. However, General Cornwallis had to guess at which direction George Washington would have his troops retreat in. In the night, George Washington had his troops go around the side of the British forces, so that the next day, when most of the forces went out to try to find the American soldiers, they could outnumber the remaining guards at the British base. The next day, the British took off in hunt of the colonists. However, when they got to the colonists' base, there was no one there. However, back at the British base, the colonists outnumbered the British five to one. The colonists suffered merely 40 casualties as a result of this battle, whereas the British suffered over 275. This was a great morale boost for the colonists, but the British just claimed that it was a small battle and they didn't really feel like it was that great of a loss. Jersey had been through rape and plunder as a result of the Hessian mercenaries. Now, as the Patriot militia resumed control, New Jersey Loyalists faced exile or humiliating repatriation as a result of a decision by Howe to give up on all New Jersey Loyalists permanently. The Battle of Saratoga was the turning point of the American Revolutionary Conflict and War. Jonathan, Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne, wanted to isolate the New England colonies from their other colonies. The British wanted to do so in a three-pronged attack, but the other two parts of the campaign failed, because Sir William Howe went to Philadelphia instead of helping out Burgoyne, and Sir Henry Clinton was delayed along the Hudson. The natives allied with the British were given the green light to raid, and as a result, many atrocities were committed, such as the scalping of Jane McCree, an innocent loyalist-tied woman who was scalped and killed. That led to some loyalist and patriot outrage and increased army signups to the Continental Army. After that, the British swiftly captured Fort Ticonderoga 
and Burgoyne sent some troops to uh, near Bennington to capture supplies. But John Stark beat back Burgoyne's troops at Bennington, at the Battle of Bennington, and Burgoyne was left slightly hindered. The Continental General Horatio Gates was a very cautious man, and he wanted to take the defensive, so he took it, because he was in command of the Continental Army at Saratoga. But his insubordinate sub-commander, Benedict Arnold, wanted to take the offensive, and Arnold was a pretty good general, so he took it upon himself to counterattack, and he breached the British defenses, and Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne had to withdraw, and then Gates cautiously surrounded the British. Gentleman Johnny Burgoyne surrendered chivalrously, because he was a chivalrous man. 86% of Burgoyne's command was captured at the Battle of Saratoga. And it was a devastating loss for the British, but it was really outstandingly amazingly good to the Continental cause because it led to France supporting them in the war effort, and France became America's ally. Fun fact about the legendary Battle of Saratoga. The brave and daring Benedict Arnold was injured when his horse was shot and it fell on his leg, crushing it like a shoe crushes a snail. After two colonial defeats at the battles of Brandywine and Germantown, George Washington and his men retired for the winter at Valley Forge. Washington chose Valley Forge for a couple reasons. First, its location was easily defensible. Second, it was located just 20 miles northwest of Philadelphia, which allowed them to keep the pressure on the British who were residing there. The Continental Army of 12,000, under the command of General George Washington, marched into Valley Forge on December 19, 1997. Within just three days, the first log hut was completed. A month later, 2,000 of these huts were constructed, providing some protection from the harsh winter conditions. Each hut required 80 logs, some of which had to be gathered from miles away. Defensive trenches and redoubts were dug just in case of British attack. A bridge was erected over the Shulkill River in order for them to resupply everything they needed. The conditions at Valley Forge were far from ideal. With barely enough food to survive, soldiers had to eat meals that consisted of only flour and water. Also, many of these soldiers lacked the sufficient clothing required for surviving the cold winter months. Roughly 2,000 men died at Valley Forge, about two-thirds of them due to disease. Diseases including typhoid, typhus, smallpox, dysentery, and smallpox thrived at Valley Forge. With the close proximities and the subpar sanitary conditions, disease was spread with ease through the encampment. The colonial army up to this point was a ragtag group of people who knew little to nothing about fighting in a war. Washington knew that if he wanted to win the war that he would have to train them to become soldiers. To do so, he hired Hessian Baron Frederick Wilhelm von Steuben. Steuben began by training 100 men, who taught another unit of men, until the whole army was trained. Von Steuben played an important role in ensuring the colonial victory. By the end of the winter, the newly trained men retook Philadelphia, and the British retreated to New York. Fun fact! <laughs> More colonial men died at Valley Forge than at the battles of Brandywine and Germantown combined despite the fact that no shots were fired. On August 16, 1780, a battle broke out six miles north of Camden, South Carolina. This battle was later known as the Battle of Camden. This was a major victory for the British in the southern portion of the American Revolution. This victory strengthened the British hold on the Carolinas. 
the British army under command of General Lord Cornwallis defeated the Continental Army under the command of Horatio Gates. The colonists were outnumbered two to one, but Gates insisted that they fight this hopeless battle. Gates and his men arrived first at the battle scene and took up their positions. Cornwallis arrived later. Cornwallis ordered his men to fire upon the right flank and followed up with a bayonet charge. This was very effective against the Continental Army, who lacked the bayonets that the British had. The survivors of the right flank volley ran away quickly as the British drew near, charging ferociously with their bayonets. Fear spread to the left flank of the Colonial Army, and they too began to flee. Gates came to realization that they were going to lose, and fled along with half of his troops. This left the remaining soldiers outnumbered four to one. The Continental Army surrendered, and it marked the colonial defeat and forced them to rebuild their army. Rebuilding their army required recruiting new people and training them to fight like real soldiers, which took quite a bit of time. Fun fact! <laughs> the Virginian militia ran away so fast that they only suffered three casualties at the Battle of Camden. Another fun fact. <laughs> General Horatio Gates did not just flee the battle scene. He rode 30 miles away from the battle, deserting not only his men, but also his importance in the war. Battle broke out on January 17, 1781 at the Battle of Cowpens. The colonial force was commanded by General Daniel Morgan, who led the colonists to a decisive victory over the British, who were commanded by Tarleton. Morgan had a force who was made up of many new recruits who had never before been in battle. This was a problem because a great number of newbies run away while participating in their first battle. Morgan was aware of this, and he knew that he could not win without these men. He devised a plan where he would set up his men so that their backs were towards a body of water. This prevented anyone from deserting the scene by giving them nowhere to run. This would have been a major fail if his plan did not work, because his whole group would get captured, whereas in a normal battle, some of the losing soldiers managed to escape. However, his plan was successful, and he defeated the British. Tarleton ordered his men to advance upon the colonial army, to counter this, Morgan ordered a volley into their advancements. He followed this up with a bayonet charge, and this worked out beautifully. Morgan gained over 700 prisoners, along with killing over 100 more, and all of this took place in roughly an hour. This battle gave the colonists the momentum that they would carry out until the end of the war. Fun fact! <laughs> Despite its name, this battle was not fought in Cowpen. The Battle of Guilford Courthouse broke out on March 15, 1781, in northern North Carolina. The colonial army was led by General Nathaniel Green, and the British were led by General Lord Cornwallis. This battle ended up to be a British victory. However, the British suffered a greater number of casualties. Green's force was mainly made up of new recruits, and he too devised a plan. His plan was to have these newbies in the front line, where they would each fire two shots into the British force. They would then run away, making the British think that they had won, and enticing the British to charge after the colonial soldiers, which they did, only to find themselves surrounded by the remaining members of Green's force. The British did win this battle, but they suffered at a loss of many lives. In the eyes of the colonial army, it too was a victory. Hi, I'm Siri. You may recognize me from some of the iPhone models, but today, I will help teach you about the American Revolution. The Battle of Yorktown took place in Yorktown, Virginia and lasted from the 28th of September all the way to the 19th of October 1781. It was the American and French forces that sieged the British and claimed victory. The leaders of the battle were George Washington, American forces, Lieutenant General de Rochambeau, French forces, versus Major General Lord Charles Cornwallis, British forces, 
Cornwallis was losing his grip on the Carolinas. He marched his army to Virginia to St. Yorktown and Gloucester, towns that were on either side of the James River. Cornwallis hoped to keep his men in the Chesapeake town until fresh supplies and reinforcements could arrive from Britain. With the arrival of another French fleet, General Washington was able to march south out of New York and attack the British with the joint French-American fleet. The American-French force formed a semicircle around the entrenchment and put the British under siege. With French fleets successfully blocking Chesapeake Bay, where the British had been hoping for aid, his first move was the inexplicable one of abandoning a line of four redoubts that dominated the British positions. The Americans immediately occupied the empty redoubts. The Americans began formal siege operations on the eastern side of Yorktown on September 30th and on October 9th were sufficiently close to begin an artillery bombardment. On October 14th the Americans and French stormed two redoubts in front of their trenches and the position of the British in Yorktown became untenable. The French Navy kept the British out of the Chesapeake Bay until Cornwallis was forced to surrender his entire unit of nearly 8,000 troops on October 19, 1781. The capture of the troops severely hampered the British war effort. The Battle of Yorktown turned the British public against the war and this battle would be known as the final major battle of the Revolutionary War. The following March a pro-American parliament was elected and peace negotiations began in earnest. The Treaty of Paris was signed on September 3, 1783 formally ending the war between Great Britain and America, after the major British defeat at Yorktown. Peace talks in Paris began in April. 1,782 between Richard Oswald representing Great Britain and the three American negotiators, John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, and John Jay. This would guarantee a future for the United States. The American negotiators were joined by Henry Lawrence two days before the preliminary articles of peace were signed on November 30, 1782. Two crucial provisions of the treaty were British recognition of U.S. independence and the delineation of boundaries that would allow for American Western expansion. In return, Americans agreed to honor debts owed to British merchants from before the war and to stop persecuting British loyalists. This officially ended the war between the United States and England. The treaty like many others, was named for the city in which it was negotiated and signed. The last page bears the signatures of David Hartley, who represented Great Britain, and the three American negotiators, who signed their names in alphabetical order. This officially marked America's independence from Great Britain and the end of the Revolutionary War. During the American Revolution, there were two sides, the Loyalists, or Tories, and the Patriots. The Patriots were the ones who wanted to break away from England and form a new country of the United States. The Loyalists, or Tories, were the ones who remained loyal to England and wanted to put down the rebellion. The Patriots argued that the British were neglecting them and not giving them the same rights as Englishmen, even though they were promised them. One of their main arguments was the saying, no taxation without representation, because the British did not allow the colonists into Parliament, and yet they still tax them. The Quartering Act was an infringement of their rights, and they used this, among other acts, in their reasoning for breaking away from Britain. They believed that by natural law, it was their duty to break away from their mother country. On the other hand, the Loyalists believed that they had the right to tax the colonists because of the protection that they had provided during the French and Indian War. The King of England, King George III, was determined to keep his colonies because they benefited Britain. The colonies brought in a large amount of money and it would hurt Britain as a whole to lose them. 
The colonists attempted to solve this issue peacefully with the Olive Branch Treaty, but King George III declined their offer. The Patriots then turned to violence against the Loyalists to gain the separation that they wanted. Some important Patriot leaders were George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Ethan Allen, Baron von Steuben, and Marquis de Lafayette. George Washington was the head of the Patriots and led the Continental Army. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, which explained the reasons for breaking away from England, and he was also a member of the Second Continental Congress. Benjamin Franklin helped organize the Committee of Correspondence, and he was also a part of the Continental Congress. Fun fact! <laughs> Benjamin Franklin wrote the first known pros and cons list. Ethan Allen was the leader of the soldiers located in Vermont, known as the Green Mountain Boys. He and his men captured Fort Ticonderoga in New York. Baron von Steuben trained the Patriot Army during the winter at Valley Forge. He also went on to command the army at several different battles. Marquis de Lafayette served as a general in the American Revolution. These two sides could not see eye to eye on things, and it left the American colonies divided into the Loyalists and the Patriots. There were a great deal of hardships during the American Revolution. Some of these hardships included the lack of proper clothing, severe cold during winters, spread of disease, lack of proper sanitation, lack of food, military desertions, and families being torn apart. The Continental Army was an odd group of people who were fighting for their freedom. Many of these people had no prior experience in war. The Colonial Army did not have the funding to make sure that every soldier had the sufficient clothing, so many of them suffered. The war in the Northeast brought about the problem of severe cold during the winters. This, in addition to not enough clothing, contributed to many instances of pneumonia and hypothermia. The spread of disease during the American Revolution resulted in a large number of deaths. Typhoid, typhus, smallpox, dysentery, and pneumonia were among the numerous diseases that caused so many deaths. Many of these deaths took place at the winter at Valley Forge. The lack of proper sanitation contributed to the spread of disease. The reason so many people died at Valley Forge was that there were too many people living in this place for too long a period of time. This gave diseases the perfect opportunity to thrive, especially in the densely populated areas. Another hardship during the war was the lack of food. Many people died due to starvation during the American Revolution. The colonies just did not have the sufficient money to properly feed all of its soldiers. Fun, Fun fact! fact! In some instances, the soldiers had to eat a mixture of flour and water in order for their survival. These were called fire cakes. Many soldiers of the Continental Army were newbies, and roughly half of these newbies would desert the war effort in their first battle. This left the army vulnerable against the massive British army. In order to counter these desertions, the colonial commander at the Battle of Cowpens forced his soldiers to put their backs to the water, which prevented them from running. The final hardship was that it tore families apart. In some cases, the sons would go off to war and the families would never see them again. In other cases, families would dispute over whether they were to be loyalists or patriots. In the American Revolution, the colonists had a lot of advantages over the British. One advantage was that the colonists didn't have to wait for weeks for supplies to ship over from Britain. They also had the will to win, which Britain simply didn't have. The British soldiers couldn't recreate this will to win because they were being paid to fight, whereas the colonists had a certain emotional investment in their own independence. And to get that independence, the colonists knew that they must win this war against the British. To win the war, Britain had to persuade every colonist that independence was not a good idea. The colonists only had to survive until the British realized that the fight was not worth continuing. Another advantage that the colonists had was that as the war continued to go on, the people of the colonies continued to get more and more angry at the British. This made independence more and more appealing as time went on. 
The British did have some advantages. They outnumbered the colonists in almost every battle in the war, and they had better training than the colonists. However, the colonists' will just would not break. The British had seen battle after battle, war after war won, by what was considered the finest navy as well as the greatest army in the entire world. For a hundred years, the British had beat the Spanish and the French in every single war they'd been in. The British Parliament could much more easily raise the funds needed to support the army, whereas the Continental Congress had a much more difficult time funding their army. Fun fact! <laughs> One out of every five colonists openly favored the crown, and almost half of the population hoped to avoid the conflict altogether. The colonists even had difficulty raising funds to purchase blankets and shoes for their soldiers. The British army, on the other hand, was so rich that it could afford to pay Hessian troops to come fight instead of British soldiers. The British clearly had the advantage going into the war, however, as time went on and troops became more and more tired, people began to question why they were in this war. And as people began to question why they were in this war, they decided that it was not in fact worth it to be in this war at all. The British soldiers were simply in this war because their government wanted to make a quick buck off the colonists, whereas the colonists were in this war because they wanted their own independence and they wanted to stop being controlled by the tyrannical British Empire. The British, at first glance, seem to have the advantage in this war. However, the more deeply you look into it, you may in fact see that the colonists had the advantage. Women during the revolution played a vital role for the household economy and the war itself. Controversially, women's roles were limited by the traditional stereotypes and regulations. While women felt the influence of the revolutionary spirit, the rebel colonies needed the support of women to provide substitutes for the British goods. American women in sewing circles produced a product called homespun to replace the imported British textiles. These circles also acted as social meetings where political issues were discussed. Women shunned the purchasing and consumption of British goods such as tea and vocally proclaimed their preferences for products with local origin. Many participated in parades, riots and some women organized them. Even some upper-class women supported the war like Esther DeBert Reed and Sarah Franklin back they started a women's fundraising organization to help the rebels. George Washington advised the women to provide clothes for the army instead of money. Women responded by providing more than 2,000 linen shirts by the end of the year. Deborah Sampson disguised herself as a man and served in the infantry for a year. She was discharged with honors in 1783. Many women who helped the army by cooking, cleaning and nursing. Washington set a quota of one woman for every 15 soldiers in the Continental Army. Women of the regiment received regular rations but also faced military discipline. Many women decided to take advantage of the new public spirit and sought to expand the rights of their gender. Abigail Smith Adams, writers Judith Sargent Murray and Mercy Otis Warren raised important questions about the role of a woman in Republican society. Despite their extreme efforts, very little political achievement took place. To conclude, Many historians point out that if women did not put such effort into the war, there may have been a different outcome. African Americans during the war was controversial, yet important aspect of the war effort. Early battles at Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill Free and enslaved blacks fought alongside white patriots. The Committee of Safety resolved only free men could enter the army by late May. And in September a delegate from South Carolina presented a resolution to the Continental Congress urging the dismissal of all blacks from the army. This policy was ultimately not accepted, but several officers followed own policies of excluding all blacks from serving. 
The British hoped that the very threat of rebellion would pacify the colonists and that the actual desertion of slaves would cause great economic hardship. The British began to accept slaves into their army and promised them freedom after the war. In 1776, Congress allowed the recruitment of free blacks and within a year shortages of soldiers encouraged the patriots to accept blacks in large numbers into the military. The majority of black patriot troops came from northern states, but even states such as South Carolina and Georgia that prohibited the enlistment of blacks used them as auxiliaries. Possibly 5,000 of the 30,000 patriot troops were black, enlisting in both armies. This shows that blacks were not fighting for one side in particular but for their own freedom. Many blacks also served on warships or on private vessels. The Continental Navy, unlike the Army, recruited blacks, both free and enslaved. This was partly due to their need for sailors of any race, but also that many blacks were experienced, having worked on merchant ships or by serving in the British and state navies. As many as a quarter of the slaves who escaped to the British ended up on ships. Blacks on both sides served as pilots, carpenters, laborers, and also often performed a range of menial duties. Both the British and the Americans were afraid to arm blacks. Yet blacks were probably present on one or both sides for every major battle of the revolution. Both armies accepted or enlisted blacks in the military to win a war, not to enact social change. The revolution gave blacks a chance to articulate and indulge their desire for freedom. While the war did not lead to emancipation, it united blacks in their belief of freedom. It helped to create a sense of community and gave them a position from which to fight for the abolition of slavery which was fought for throughout another entire century, until the end of the Civil War, and is still happening today. Guerrilla warfare was a very prominent form of warfare on both sides. It's a common misconception that the British didn't contribute in the guerrilla warfare area of warfare. They did, however, have Native American allies that raided the colonists, and the colonists also had Native American allies that raided the British. Um, a regular warfare was very common with the colonists because it consisted of armed civilians attacking larger armies with just what they had to attack them with, such as farm tools or their family musket or their, their butter knives or um, other such implements of destruction. So George Washington of the Continental Army didn't want to use guerrilla warfare because he thought that it was beneath them. He wanted to use the European-style tactics of the British Army, but he he himself realized that that wasn't going to be an op going to be an option until they built up a strong enough army. So, because Britain was better equipped, the colonists had to take advantage of terrain. They had to do some sniping, like they did at the Battle of Saratoga, and uh, they had to retreat after they struck. In a small skirmish, they had to always retreat. They even hid behind rocks and walls and trees and houses, like at the Battle of Concord. Um, all these tactics were very effective at demoralizing the British troops, because how are you going to shoot someone if they're ducking behind some cover and they're running away and they blow up your privy when you're trying to relieve yourself or... They're burning your crops when you're trying to get enough food to to feed your army, and they're throwing snow at you when you're really cold. It's winter, and you have snow down the back of your coat. 
and it's on your neck and it's ma it's getting really icy and then the rebels they they were very effective at demoralizing the british troops and weakening the british troops the the big professional armies with their small skirmishes and their guerrilla warfare um and they even prevented the British occupation of New Jersey. Fun fact about guerrilla warfare. <laughs> because of lack of guerrillas, the colonists could not properly utilize the guerrillas in their guerrilla warfare. They instead had to rely on sneak attacks. Nathaniel Green was a very trusted general and a friend of Washington. At, when he was younger, he read many, many books on military science because he had a vast library that his father had. He became a major general after Lexington and Concord, and he fought under Washington. Um, several battles that he fought under Washington were Trenton, Brandywine, and the winter at Valley Forge. Afterwards, he was named Quartermaster General, and he didn't, didn't have the ability to lead armies, um, and he was kind of upset about that. He was a bit cross. Uh, he resigned due to fighting with con Congress and became the commander of West Point. Uh, then, after that, Green became the commander of the Southern forces in the Southern theater of the war. Um, and Green had to go up against Lord Commander Cornwallis of the British Isles. And Green was a sly dog, however, and eluded Cornwallis. He was a very sneaky fighter. Green had minimal forces, um, and he lost to Cornwallis at the Battle of Guilford Courthouse. Uh, it, uh, it was a tactical loss, but Green suffered very few losses, and Cornwallis had many, many losses. Then Cornwallis allowed Green to survive, and Cornwallis fled up to Virginia. After outmaneuvering Cornwallis, Green fought the British leader Rawdon at Hobkirk's Hill, and Rawdon won an empty victory. After that, Rawdon was pushed back to the sea, and Green won back North and South Carolina because Cornwallis had fled the South. Um, when the war was over, Green was given 5,000 guineas and 24,000 acres of land by the Continental government because of his outstanding efforts in the war effort. Fun fact about General Nathaniel Green. Green was not, however, given 5,000 guinea hens and guinea pigs, um, contrary to popular opinion. Uh, some folks have said that Nathaniel Green was given many guinea hens and guinea pigs to inhabit his farmland, but those sources were incorrect. So that is, that is more of a Revolutionary War myth than a truth. Another fun fact about Nathaniel Green. <laughs> Guineas were a form of continental currency not a type of animal, in any sense.
George Washington was a prominent Virginian. He fought in the French and Indian Wars, and he then afterwards he managed a plantation. He hated British taxes, and when the war broke out, he was elected the commander-in-chief of the Continental Army because he was a southerner and the New England congressman needed to elect someone uh, to unify the colonies. They needed a southern commander. <clears throat> General George Washington did not have the amount of troops as the British did, or the supplies, so he ended up harassing the British as much as possible, and he lost a uh, great many battles and had to end up retreating a lot. Um, he, he did, however, win Trenton and Princeton, um, and after Trenton and Princeton, he gained a pretty good reputation, which, um, which kind of signified more troops signing up and better training. Um, and then uh, he, lost, he lost the Battle of Brandywine, and that, then Philadelphia was captured, which was not so great. Um, and then he fought the Battle of Monmouth, but it was a standoff, and he couldn't pursue the British army. Uh, then, when he received the help from the French, he won the Siege of Yorktown, which signified the defeat of the British. And after the Siege of Yorktown, he resigned his commander in chiefdom. Um, and several years after the war ended, he was unanimously elected the president, of, the first president of the United States of America. He did not, however, run for a second term, um, and because he wasn't as an ambitious man, and kind of, kind of a um, a, a reluctant hero in a sense. Um, as a general, he was a very kind general to his men. Uh, but he still wanted discipline. He wanted that European-style army that the British had or other, you know, famous European generals had. Um, so he was kind of a kind but strict mother, in a sense, to his army. Um, but that's, that's probably why he's known as one of the greatest generals, just because he turned this kind of ragtag force into... Um, a force that could win battles and war in, in the long run. Fun fact about General George Washington, the major general and commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. <laughs> Two of George Washington's favorite horses were Blueskin and Nelson. Another fun fact about Major General George Washington, Commander-in-Chief. George Washington preferred his horse Nelson as a battle horse because he was less skittish than Blueskin. So
Let them steal.